Hey, I'm Ron Johnson, and this is the Ron Johnson Show. We're going to do something a little different today. On today's show, I got two guests. We got Nash Walker from Locked On Twins because, I mean, unless you're under a rock, you haven't heard about Carlos Correa. And we're, we got to dig into this because, for me, I'm wondering why the Twins aren't worried like every other team is worried. But maybe the Twins know something that they don't know. And then we also have Peerless Price. If you don't remember Peerless Price, played for Tennessee, played with Peyton Manning, played for the Buffalo Bills. So there's a lot around his circle of influence that we need to talk to Peerless Price about. And also, I mean, he was one of my favorite receivers. One of the first receivers I've ever seen wearing number 37 and make it look good. So we got to talk to him about that. And then we're going to jump into the Daily Three, a little more playoff talk, Vikings, Giants, 49ers, Seahawks. Let's see how it all pans out. Coming up next on the Ron Johnson Show. Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast. And it starts now. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Ron Johnson Show, and I'm your host, Ron Johnson. And like I promised, starting off, we're going to have a guest early, so let's just get right into it. Let's bring in Nash Walker from Locked On Twins. Um, Nash, thank you for joining me today on the Ron Johnson Show. Also, people, I want to make sure you guys remember, you can get all of our Locked On content on Amazon Fire and Roku. Please just go to the Amazon Fire or Roku apps, download it. Make sure you put it right there on your TV. You get all of our videos, all of our shows. You can also see Nash's uh, pretty face every once in a while. You know, <laughs> big news happens. And so it's not really baseball season right now. It's football. It's hockey. It's basketball. But the Twins. The Twins did something a lot of people didn't think they would do. Um, I said they would make an offer, but I knew it would go elsewhere. And it went elsewhere. And now, all of a sudden, Carlos Correa is back with the Twins. I think $270 million. But every other team had a question about his leg. So I'm going to jump out there, Nash. What's going on with his leg and why aren't the Twins worried about it? Yeah, Ron, thank you for having me. It's it's good to finally join you on the show. I no, see all the it. sweet guests. I'm like, man, <laughs> I'm glad to join the group. It's really fun. Uh, if you would have showed me right at the beginning of the offseason and said, hey, he's going to sign a six-year, $200 million guaranteed contract, I would laugh at you, honestly. That, that was not even in the realm of possibility here. Correa was going to get... I thought he would get less than 300, but just less than 300. I thought he would get like 285, 290, 295 guaranteed money. And he did. He got 350 from the Giants, then 315 from the Mets, and now 200 with the Twins. So my first thought with this is he went from 350 million with San Francisco to 200 guaranteed with the Twins because of an injury that happened when he was in the minors. The concern with the right ankle is not today. It's not a concern for this season or even 2024 mm -hmm. or 2025. The concern is how is the plate going to age? How is how is this going to look in eight, nine, ten years? And for teams like the Mets and Giants who wanted him for that length, they were concerned about the long-term stability of his ankle. A yeah. six-year deal, that takes a little bit out of that, that concern, right? Because he's 28. This is going to be his age 28 season. This deal can become, as you said, a 10-year, $270 million deal if the vesting options hit or the twins pick up those options but to if you just said told me nothing else about the middle the in between which is the craziest free agent saga we've ever seen in baseball and you said hey he's going to sign with the twins for six years and 200 million guaranteed i would say that is the best outcome that could possibly have happened for this team at this point because they they don't get these opportunities very often and we know you know growing up as minnesotans people don't always want to come here like we get that big free agents don't always want to come here and that's understandable for Correa we heard throughout he wants to be he would prefer to be in Minnesota if all things were equal and now they are their his third choice by definition like he chose California and New York teams before he came to Minnesota but this was a <laughs> unique situation this was unique where they had this opportunity he fits on the roster they need a shortstop they haven't had stability at short in forever he's in his prime he played here for a year he's close with Byron Bucks and he's close with Jose Miranda this was a prime spot for the twins to kind of break down that wall of we never do this. It's cool to see it happen. But yes, I agree, Ron. There's concern about the ankle, certainly less so than it would be on a on a 12 or 13 year deal, though. 
And when you think about this this leg, so let's go to this leg. And again, everybody knows as, as any sport, any athletes had a knee injury, foot injury, ankle injury, uh, things like uh, arthritis start to set in. Things like plates might need to be replaced because of just technology has changed from the last time that surgery was done. Uh, I've seen uh, personally, I've seen it with my wife. She had her, her back fused. And then, you know, I think what I don't remember how long it was later, but, you know, 10 10, 12 years later, she had to have the, the screws removed mm. because her body started to grow around and kind of uh, make it uncomfortable for screws to be in her spine. And so there's a lot of things like that that come up where technology is going to change. And, and, and that's why I think teams were nervous. The twins are saying, like you said, six years, that's enough. But we all know in baseball, your team only goes as far as your pitchers. You mm. can have the best infield in Major League Baseball. Uh, but if your pitchers are getting it smacked around and out the park, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So what are the twins going to do? Because now you do have Carlos Correa. You have Byron Buxton. Uh, you have some hitters. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do to solidify this, this pitching bullpen? Because you look at guys like Justin Ver Verlander, and I'm a big Detroit guy from Detroit, so I loved him with the, the, the uh, Tigers, mm -hmm. moves on to the Houston Astros, wins a championship. And now you look at a team like the Twins, and I wouldn't say Justin Verlander because he's kind of this is kind of towards the end of his career. But who are some players out there like that that the Twins might be able to to to? I don't know if they need to beg, get on their knees, plead, uh, get A Rod to get involved. In this. You know, yeah. he's a he's a New York guy, but he's now a Minnesota guy. So can A Rod help the Twins get some pitching here? I mean, I don't know what do they need to get J Lo back with Ben Affleck? I don't know. <laughs> but whatever the Twins need to do, what do they need to do to get some pitching here? I was at the gym last week and I saw A-Rod and I maybe next time I'll go up to him and say, Hey, what do you, what do you think? And Carlos Correa, I, apparently A-Rod's his idol, like shortstop primetime shortstops is he's his idol, but there's not a whole lot left Ron on the free agent market. This was a unique situation. You mentioned uh, Verlander. It was Verlander and DeGrom at the top. And we knew like, that's not going to happen for the mm -hmm. twins. They're going to have their pick, especially Verlander. He goes to New York. DeGrom is a ranger. And you could argue like the twins should have been more involved on DeGrom. But I just didn't see Verlander coming here this late with a team that he, he wants to win. He wants to be assured that he's going to win and have a chance at a World Series. That's in New York with the Mets more than it is with the twins. Certainly, I mean, did they not show Kate Upton? Like the Mall of America? Like, come yeah, on. I, don't, I don't know why he wouldn't, but he's he's going to go to New York and pitch for the Mets. And then DeGrom with the Rangers, there's no income tax down there. It's still a big market. It's Arlington. Yeah. They gave him a ton of money. So those two were like the top. And then you had Carlos Rodon was that next tier. And he was someone I was talking about all offseason. Big lefty, 98 to 100. Ace. You know, he's an ace caliber pitcher with some shoulder problems. So I thought maybe he could get into the Twins price range. Yankees signed him. So it's, you know, Mets, Yankees, Rangers at the top there. That's It's it's hard to get around that. Last year, they should have signed a frontline starter. There was a lot of them available. They didn't sign any. And this year, there just there weren't many in free agency. And now I think what's going to happen, and I made this case last night, is I think they're going to get aggressive in the trade market. I don't know if it's going to be one of those top echelon big names, but a controllable, solid young starter brandon woodruff and corbin burns are like co-aces in milwaukee they're two guys we've been monitoring throughout the offseason the twins have not had a true ace every fifth day since johan santana and i know that wow. you you watch and you see it i watch and i see it they haven't had that since forever ago they need that and i think they're hoping it comes out of the system but at this point i wouldn't say anybody in the system is ready to take that step in 2023 or even 2024 so they do need to go out and get a frontline starter that was one of the top three needs this offseason go get another frontline starter and if they did ron the roster looks really nice at that point then you have a deep group in the lineup you have a deep group in the pitching staff the rotation is a lot deeper than it was a year ago on opening day that you'd be cooking with peanut oil at that point as they say they'd be like probably 88 to 91 wins on paper that's the sweet spot to get into the playoffs they would look really nice if they did that and i think they will i'll predict that they will go out and trade for a frontline starter and aaron gleeman and john bonus were talking about this yesterday i think correa i i, I predict with them that carlos said hey if i'm gonna do this you, you got to commit to this you have to commit to building around me a little bit and when byron signed that extension last year mm -hmm. you have to commit to building around him too if you're gonna sign byron buxton to a seven-year hundred million dollar deal in the middle of his prime you got to bump payroll. You got to do things like sign Carlos Correa. You got to do things like trade for frontline starters because you don't know how they're going to age and you want to 
build as much as you can around them in their primes. And for Byron, you don't know if he's going to be healthy. And if he is, you want to make it matter. And to do that, you have to build around him and build the best roster possible every given year. And now that you've signed Correa, there's a clear, a clear direction. And that direction is we're going to try to put the best team on the field in 2023, even if that means making risky trades, trading top prospects for frontline starting pitching. Because now you're you're in a position where you can get there, where you can reasonably project to win the division, where you can reasonably project to, to make the playoffs. And I think the Twins will take those next steps here in the next month or so. And we look at the Twins as a whole. Um, they're not a sexy organization. Uh, if yeah. this were the if this were the Yankees, this would be all over ESPN. This would be all over every network. Um, it, it's not. Carlos Correa and the Twins are not making a ton of noise right now. Um, it also happened in the dark of night. Like it was one mm -hmm. of those deals that all of a sudden you look at your phone and you're like, wait, what? Is mm -hmm. this real? Like, is this a spoof? Um, what is it about this deal in the Twins as an organization? Um, that you don't get the leaks. Like if this were the Yankees, you would have had leaks all out the yin yang of like, oh, Carlos Correa might be a Yankee. It's coming. Like his or whether it's his agent leaking it to to get the buzz up, or whether his agent kept this quiet because of the two previous like denials of like, all right, well if you guys are gonna balk on this, you know, mm -hmm. physical, I'm gonna go try to work my magic elsewhere. And of course, he comes back to the Twins. But for him to be like you said, they're the third choice. And for anybody who's been in a relationship. The third choice, the person that is the third choice, when they figure that out, they're not happy. Yeah. Are the twins players, and not so much the players, but is the organization really completely happy with Carlos Correa, the, him being their third choice? I think there's an understanding here that it was going to take uh, crazy circumstances or a really strict set of circumstances for this to happen. It just, it's never happened for the twins before. Carlos Correa is a generational type of shortstop. I said it last night. He's fourth in wins above replacement through an age 27 season since the twins came over. And it's a rod Cal Ripken, Jr. Robin Young, Carlos Correa. Like he's in that echelon of player twins. Don't do that in free agency for, you know, for whatever reason, they don't want to spend the money. Free agents don't want to come here. I think throughout this process, there was there was a feeling like they're not going to do this. They've never done this. So there's a focus on the, the big markets, of course. And there was also a feeling Carlos Correa wants to be in a big market. He wants to shine in New York. He wants to shine in California. Look where he signed. <laughs> you know, initially agreed to deals with both of those teams in the Mets and the Giants. So there was just... There was skeptic. Everybody was skeptical. Like you can hear the twins are offering. The twins are doing this. The twins are doing that. They love Correa. Correa loves the twins. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's the twins. And, and people didn't believe. And I was skeptical too that this would ever happen. And I think your point: Why is there not more around this? I think people are shocked. One, I think people are are just like confused. And they were last year when he signed this this three year quasi one year deal with the twins. There's like. People are confused about why this happened, how this happened, why is he a twin? Because this just doesn't happen. These types of players don't play for the twins. They don't sign with the twins in free agency. They've had players of this caliber, like Joe Maurer, and you know Byron has that talent, but they've never signed them in free agency. So people are just surprised. I think the national media is surprised, and this twins front office is already pretty tight with their information. Usually they just drop things out of thin air so that's part of it too but there's just surprise all around that it happened twice in two consecutive off seasons yeah and for the twins i mean again it's it's unheard of for them to spend money uh we knew it was going to be a a, a a team friendly deal but also works out for the player and again at the end of the day 200 million dollars is a lot of money i don't know yeah. why uh people feel like like oh this person should be like i get the 300 350 million uh, but at the end of the day, after 10 years, can you really say at the end of that, you look at A-Rod, you look at um, uh, what was his other guy with the with the with the um, the other big signing that the Yankees had with A-Rod? Jeter and A-Rod. Jeter, yeah, yeah, exactly. So Jeter, A-Rod, those two, when you look at those signings and how much money they spent and did it really work out? Was it really worth it? I mean, I, I mean when you go through all of that and you look at uh, what you get out of those players at the end, I could see the Twins thinking that. Like, they, there's been so many teams that have been burned, but at the end of the day, the Yankees do that because the Yankees know they can keep reloading. Exactly. As those guys get older, they're going to add younger guys to help them mm -hmm. out, uh, whereas the Twins uh, don't really, mm, you know, like they don't really continue to sign guys. Exactly. But maybe this is a sign of change. Uh, maybe this is a sign of new things to come. Uh, but we'll see. We will see what's happening, what's going on with this team. But at the end of the day, Carlos Correa, is a twin. 
Um, you did say if they were to get a, a front line pitcher, 90 wins without a front line pitcher, real quick, quick 20 seconds before we get out of here. Mm -hmm. Without and this is early, so this is not we're not holding you to this. We're not gonna put put freezing cold takes on you or anything like this. But if they just stick with what they have right now, they don't find a front line pitcher, same pitchers. Are they better than last year or the same? They're better because they have Tyler Malley and Jorge Lopez on opening day, and they're by you know just hypothetically healthy on opening okay. day. So yes, I think right now, eighty four to eighty six win team on paper today. Okay, wow. Well, there you have it, eighty six win team right now. <laughs> healthy pitchers though. Let's yeah, let's be, we got we got to have health. We need health luck this year. Carlos sure. Correa healthy. Byron yes. Buxton. Hopefully, we keep him in a bubble. Yeah, um, because he has to make it to open day healthy. So, yeah, because yeah. Byron Buxton, as we know, is not hurt right now, right? As we no, know he's, he's okay. okay now, yes. So he's as long okay. as he's healthy, Carlos Correa is healthy, uh, maybe we get some bash brother action, some back-to-back -back yeah. homers, um, some big plays at short. And, and everybody knows. I mean, my daughter played shortstop or plays shortstop. She plays a little bit outfield now, too, in second base. But when she was a shortstop, when they won the national championship uh, for 10U, the shortstop matters. The shortstop has yeah. to be the best player in the field. And so Carlos Correa is that guy. And if you can have confidence in your shortstop, you can have confidence within the team because the second base, the third base, the catcher, even throwing the balls down, everybody feels better doing their job when they know the shortstop's taken care of. Mm -hmm. the Twins have done that with Carlos Correa, $200 million, as, Brand, uh, as Nash said. Uh, what, 270 over 10 years if they decide to exercise those options? My guess is the Twins won't. <laughs> yeah. We'll get we'll six years out of him. Yeah, yeah, we'll see where he's at. I mean, if they do, that means it went great, right? It went great the first six, so. Exactly. Well, that'll do it for uh, Nash Walker, Ron Johnson. Coming up next on the Ron Johnson Show, as I said, we got Peerless Price coming. Uh, different Ron Johnson Show today. We got two guests, so it's a it's a major show. When you got a, a Twins player signing money, you got to throw it in there. But as one, the Vikings uh, saying, so we got to talk some playoffs. But we're going to talk college football because – there was some big movement in college football this week. There were some big comments made this week, and there's some coaches that aren't happy. So we'll think what Peerless Price thinks about that. Coming up next on the Ron Johnson Show. And remember, people, check out our Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast on YouTube following every Twins, Vikings, Wild, or Wolves game. Our Locked On team hosts are broadcasting live with team insiders. Never miss a podcast by subscribing to Locked On Sports Minnesota's YouTube channel. And we have a word from our sponsors. Thanks, Ron. BetOnline.net brings you today's show. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. It's all the pro and amateur leagues out there. NBA and NHL featured now along with the NFL playoffs. No more college football, but hey, you've got college basketball for your college fix. If you love sports podcasts, they have that at BetOnline as well. Let's check Vikings-Giants line. We check it every day on this show. Hasn't changed. Vikings minus three over under 48. Sunday, 340 kickoff at U.S. Bank Stadium. Get that and plenty more at betonline.net. Also find it on your mobile device. It's Bet Online, where the game starts. Well, as promised, former Tennessee Vol, former Buffalo Bill, NFL receiver, Peerless Price. And this one for me, uh, like having Chris Carter on, uh, you know, having a lot of these receivers on Adam Thielen. Uh, but Peerless Price is a guy, and I grew up watching Chris because my dad and Chris Carter, uh, but Peerless Price for me, like I, I'll never forget college football, and and there's some about Peerless, and we'll talk about that too, that he wore number 37. Like I was always like, receivers got to wear one, two, you know, nine, you got to, you know, you got to have something sexy. And he came on the 37 with the spat, and I'm like, this dude's really doing it in the 37. And then they win the national championship. And uh, so I'm excited that Peerless Price joined me on the Ron Johnson show. Uh, hang on, Ron Johnson segment. Peerless, man. First, uh, let's jump out there, man. Number 37. What was what was that about? Where'd that come from? Ron, so let me tell you. And I'm going to try to be brief. But so a lot of people don't know this because I ended up playing in the NFL a long time as a wide receiver and playing at Tennessee. But most of the schools in the country coming out of high school wanted me to play defensive back. Okay. Well, Tennessee and Florida – Tennessee, Florida, and Ohio State were my final three schools, mainly because they said I could play receiver. Well, I get to Tennessee. I choose Tennessee because of Peyton. He was the yep. year ahead of me. So I choose Tennessee. And when I get there, they give me number 37. They tell me I'm a DP. <laughs> so, so, so I'm going to tell you, it's like if you read my bio for my freshman year, it says after about a homesickness, 
I really wasn't homesick. I was pissed that they, they gave me 37 and, <laughs> and told me I was a defensive back. Um, so I spent the first, I would say I was the first month or month or so. I remember playing Georgia in Knoxville. They had Heinz Ward, Robert Edwards. Oh, they were yeah. really good. And I actually went into that game as a defensive back. And then one of our receivers, yeah, one of our receivers ended up getting hurt. And then uh, Coach Warmer tells me that I can play wide receiver on scout team. And I went over there on a mission. And I never played defensive back again after that week we, we played Georgia. And then and he just so went into my sophomore year. I'm going to tell you, going into my sophomore year, Coach Former comes to me and is like, well, you've earned the starting receiver spot, the flank oh. spot. And he goes, do you want to change your number to number three? Ronnie Pillow, one of the running backs, was uh, graduating. He said, you want to change the number to number three? And I was like, no, I want to be 37 because I want every time y'all look at me, <laughs> for y'all to remember, y'all told me I was defensive back. <laughs> so, and that's why I kept it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, see, and that would have you know what though that would have made it because three was my number. So like, and, okay. and that, was, yeah. that was because of, that was because of Keyshawn though. So yeah, when I was when I was you know another guy I was growing up with loved him Keyshawn. I get to meet him because Tony Dungy he ended up playing for the Bucks, and Tony Dungy is my godfather. So I remember uh, when the Bucks traveled to Minnesota to play the Vikings. Tony calls me, hey, come down to the hotel. So I went down to the hotel, and he knew because he knew my whole like I mean literally my dorm room. I had, you know, Keyshawn Johnson's like sayings up there. Mm -hmm. uh, just give me the damn ball. I had the, and, and I, and I love the fact that he beat, uh, I don't know if you remember Jer Gerald Conaway played cornerback for uh, Northwestern, but yeah. he was a high school friend of mine and Keyshawn torched him in the Rose Bowl. Oh, oh, yeah. And so I wouldn't let him live it down. And so I had that picture in my room. So anytime Gerald would uh, ask me, you know, how's school going? I'd be like, yeah, man, my room's looking good. I got a nice Rose Bowl picture of you up there. And he knew exactly what I was talking about because that play was all over social media because, or not social media at the time, internet. Right, <laughs> um, right. Because it was like Keyshawn's big come out game. And then, of course, he gets drafted to the Jets, you know, so on and so forth. But um, yeah, man. So Keyshawn wore number three. So that's why when I went to college, they gave me 89 at first. And then my sophomore year, uh, they was like, hey, what number do you want? And of course, it was three. So, yeah. So if you had gotten number three, that would have really solidified that, you know. But the 37, yeah. man, like it was, uh, I'll never forget it. Like that was, it was burning the, the spat. I could see it right now the spat, uh, the, the no socks. Uh, you know, the 37, like I, I could see it, I, like it's in my head. And so uh, I remember seeing, you know, you and Karan Riley, Jimmy Ferris pop up. And I'm like, man, I got to reach out to this guy one day. Cause I mean, not only like, do you know people I know, but I was a big fan of yours in college and in the pros. And then I ended up going to the NFL. So just keeping it, you know, seeing you, Keyshawn, uh, Chris Carter, all these guys. Like I remember mm -hmm. playing the Dolphins when Chris Carter was kind of towards the end. But even that was fun. You know, Chris is way older, but I'm like, man, we got to share the field together when, we, when he was with yeah. the Dolphins. David Boston, same thing. I got to play against David Boston. Yeah. Um, so just like those were, you guys were like the receivers. And then, of course, Ike Hillier, Redell Anthony. You remember those guys? Yes, uh, sir. So that was, yeah. yeah, Peter Warwick. That was kind of my group. Peter Warwick, Warwick Ike Hillier, Peerless Price. Like, you know, I was 6'3", 230, so I really couldn't do some of the stuff yeah. you guys did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're all now. We were yeah. blessed to be 6'3", 230. <laughs> no. I, I couldn't do all the wiggle. You know, I was just power yeah. off the line, hitches, slants, curls, uh -huh. comebacks. That's it. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. doing all the tricky stuff, but You're definitely love you guys. Exactly. That's yeah. why uh, when I got to meet Keyshawn, that was uh, that was cool to have lunch and dinner with him before the, the, the night before the game, and Tony made sure it happened, uh, and then be on the sideline for that game. So Keyshawn talked me through it. And he was also our speaker at the symposium, you know, when the rookies – Go yeah. to NFL symposium, all the draft picks, and Keyshawn was our speaker. So even that was fun because he, you know, he came up and 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 used me, Marquise Walker, Randall L, and mm -hmm. a couple of his little stories, and you know, so uh, again, before stuff was videotaped because we know what happened with Chris Carter <laughs> when they videotape those things now. Uh, this is before the videotape era, so we have stuff we can talk about off the camera. But yeah. uh, Peerless Price, yeah. I got Peerless Price with me on the Ron Johnson show, hanging with Ron Johnson segment. Uh, Peyton Manning, I mean, you play, I, I had a chance to coach him with the coach. So I coached with Tony Dungy for two years. So I got a chance to kind of be around Peyton, learn him, hear him. It's helped me in my broadcasting stuff. When I do games, mm -hmm. I'm able to understand coverages and, and understand checks and can, can and kill, kill. Mm -hmm. But you play with Peyton at an early time in his career. How was Peyton in college compared to what you see now? 
Well, now, now we're real good friends. Okay. In college, we were college, we were cool. But in college, initially, I was like, man, this guy's over the top. Like I thought, you know, because like he's invested in every yeah. part of it, and so, and now I always tell people, he took me. I was just a naturally gifted athlete, mm-hmm. and he he helped me become a student of the game because literally I was just a. Growing up in Dayton, Ohio, I mean, you know, Ohio has big time football, mm-hmm. and I literally played every sport. I played football in the fall, basketball in the winter. Averaged thirty two points my senior year. I thought I was going to the, I thought I was going to the NBA. That was my first love. Then I ran track in the spring, and so I was just a natural athlete. And then when I got to Tennessee, you know, trying to play in the SEC, you realize it takes a lot more than just being an athlete. Like you have to become a student of the game, and I, that's what Peyton did for me. And my wife will tell you, we met my sophomore year in college, our sophomore year in college, and mm-hmm. our first date, she was watching Game Film. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, and she, and she absolutely loves telling that story, and she hates it because she came to the dorm room and and she was ready to go, and I was like, no, I got to finish breaking down this company. <laughs> so. So that that's what Peyton did for me, you know. So, and, and, yes. So most dudes do like a movie and dinner. You did game film in the dinner. Yeah, I, yep. I had to, we had to finish break down that game film before we went to freaking TGI Friday. <laughs> that was a lot of money in college, TGI Friday. <laughs> oh man so you knew she wanted like she knew she liked you and she's like all right fine this dude gotta watch this film I'll, yeah. I'll do this and then we'll go eat i know she probably was telling her friends like girl you will not yes. believe what he just did no <laughs> no look she still tells people to this day i can't oh. believe this dude had me watching film <laughs> so. So, well, you know what though? At least like I saw Ocho Cinco on the beach with his his uh girlfriend, uh fiance, and he was jamming her up. He had told her to try to release, and he was yeah, like, I mean, yeah. like, at least you didn't do that. At least you didn't tell right. her to go play DB so you could get some one-on-one releases in. Right. Right. Like but that yeah, would have been over time. Me and Peyton are real cool. Like we text each other. Uh like for instance, I want to say last year, uh uh, was it like, yeah, it was when Tom, when Tom Brady, when Tampa Bay lost in the playoffs, my daughter yeah. goes, yes, they lost. <laughs> and I was like, what the heck? Like, that was just out of the blue. Now, right. she, she's, a, she's a sports fanatic like me. And so I was like, she was like, because I'm just, if he would have won another Super Bowl, then everybody really would have caught him the GOAT and he was better than Peyton. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know you felt that way about Peyton. She was just like. Yeah, he played with you, Daddy, so he has to be best. <laughs> so I text Peyton the story, and he sends her he sends her his coach jersey and a Tennessee jersey for a oh, birthday. Wow. wow. That's yeah. that's big. That's big. Yeah. Uh, so thinking so, about that, so thinking about college, you guys, you know, one of the top teams in college uh football. Uh you're on the front of Sports Illustrated. You know, they put Tennessee as peerless. Uh, like I said, I'll never forget that. Um but when you look at that run, you know, being a part of a national championship, being, you know, a part of a team that was dominant, when you look at like Georgia and so on and so forth, um, when you look at your team offensively and Georgia defensively now, how would you have stacked up versus like a Georgia now? Oh, we would have been, see, we would have presented problems for them. And that's what I, like, I, I thought Ohio State would beat them just because on the outside they were so dynamic. Yeah. And so, you know, I played with a lot of guys that were first and second round picks. Uh, Marcus Nash, Jordan yeah. Kent, myself, Cedric Wilson played a long time. His son is mm-hmm. playing right now. And so I, when I look at the way we would have matched up, I, I mean, not to take anything away from them, I think it would have been a big time matchup. Like, I, I think our teams were loaded mm-hmm. with first and second round pick Al Wilson, Deion Grant, oh, yeah. John Ellis, like Leonard Little, like, we were them, it was just in the late 90s. Right. So, I mean, you know, they say you don't want to, uh, you can't compare errors, but we did go 45 and four in four years and two SEC championships, should have been two national championships like them, but we lost to Nebraska, so they shared it with Michigan in 97, but we beat Nebraska, we're sharing the national because we lost them in the Orange Bowl. Oh, yeah. So okay. I think we would match up with any of these things. Honestly, if you're asking me, because I know what we all end up doing, 
So mm-hmm. I know our resumes. I think I think we beat them. I think we beat most of these things today because we could adapt. You know, Paul Lewis at running back, Travis Henry at running back. Like we could play either way you wanted us to play. Man, that's that's crazy. And so we think about Peyton Manning. Like I, I had him with the coach, and so he was kind of you know Tom Moore because Tom Moore, who was Peyton's offensive coordinator, and people don't know that. Uh, he was my dad's coach with the Steelers because he coached with oh, Chuck No. Uh, he was the coach at Eastern Michigan when my dad was in college. So Tom Moore was actually there when I was born. So when I became an assistant coach, um, it was funny, one, because Tom felt like I was this baby that he knew from birth. Um, yeah. But then also he was like, look, I got to baptize you. I'm going I'm to give you a heads up. Peyton is, is hard to work with. Like Peyton is a perfectionist. He's yeah. going to he's going to ask a million questions. He's going to want you to do a ton of things. And so I learned early uh, all the things of Peyton. And so one of them was um, he can change a script. You can come up with 15 plays and he's going to change all 15 during practice. Yeah. And so we literally were going to practices with blank scripts and we would just have the headsets to tell the uh, the, the second coach, hey, when he pl- when he runs the play, we'll just write it down. And then we'll yeah. sync it up with the film yeah. later because yeah. he's going to change it in practice because he's like, well, I know you guys told me to run double corner routes, but I, I think these should be like one corner route and one big post. And then mm-hmm. this guy needs to run a drag and I want this guy to run a deep over, but he's going to sit in the middle. And we're like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> he's, a, he's his own computer. He, don't need, right. he doesn't need your script. Exactly. So uh, in practice in college and in, even in games, was Peyton that type of guy in college? Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, he had, and that's one thing, again, that's why, like, going from, from Tennessee with Peyton and then going to, to Buffalo was an easy transition for me, mm-hmm. um, going from Peyton to Doug Flutie, because I will say Doug Flutie was kind of the same way. There was a lot of stuff done at the line of scrimmage. So Peyton had the, in the 90s, was at the line of scrimmage, changing plays. And then if he didn't like that play, he would audible into another play. And wow. so, yeah, like he had, we you had to know all the positions at, at Tennessee. Every receiver had to know every receiver position because if he changed the play, now your job changes and you have what that guy had on the opposite side or vice versa. So, yep. yeah, we, we, and if you didn't know it, you just didn't play. Like we had some athletes at receiver that were really good that found themselves not in the rotation and and because they couldn't they couldn't process the information fast enough. And two more before we jump into the daily three. Uh, we got Peerless Price on. So I gotta talk receivers with you. I do this with every receiver I have on. Um, when you look at today's NFL. Um, and you look at a guy like Justin Jefferson, and he played against your Buffalo Bills, had one of the best catches. Uh, because Chris Carter, uh, we, we have his his take on some of the best catches in NFL history and some of the best receivers in Vikings history. Uh, so that was epic. Uh, but when you look at Justin Jefferson and what he's doing with the NFL right now, how you know the route running, uh, do you think that's a product of just players are getting better or some of the little things like big hits? Uh, you know, DBs being able to chuck guys down the field, being taken out of the game. Uh, what what do you attribute to guys like Tyreek Hill, Justin Jefferson, and some of the numbers they're putting up now? Well, I mean, you got to think when we were playing, it was almost 55, 60% run. Like it yep. was way more balanced. Yeah. Um, now I just coached in a high school all star game and we were on the one yard line. And it was uh, the junior classic here in Atlanta, in Georgia. And this is the best juniors in the state. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of my receivers, is, he's a Georgia commit. And um, and so we were, we called timeout on the one yard line. And I asked, and I'm like, this is going to go quarterback Smith. And and Sokovi, that's his name. The receiver is like, coach, these guys don't go, they don't go under center. And so I go to the offensive coordinator. And I was like, we can't just go sneak under center. And the offensive coordinator is like, Period. These guys had probably never taken a snap on the center. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that tells you all you need to know. And we never huddled up. We were at the line. Everything's at the line. And so it's become more uh, wide open, mm-hmm. more receiver friendly, more quarterback friendly, offensive systems. And from a defensive standpoint, offense sells tickets. So when we were playing, we were getting beat up at the line of scrimmage. 
I remember Rodney Harrison literally annihilated me. Uh, I mean, kill me. Like when I say kill me, like I do a stutter go on Quentin Jammer. I'm wide open. Rodney Harrison literally hit me into the water coolers at Rob Wilson Stadium. And literally, it's like, man, I'd rather take it flat. Now he's ejected, you know, and yeah. So that, so it's become more, more wide receiver friendly, more offensive friendly. But I won't take anything away from these guys because I will say this. I think, like, I was always a perfectionist as far mm -hmm. as route running, being a technician, and getting in and out of break. But I think these guys are taking it to a next level because they're doing that consistently every day in the offseason. Mm -hmm. I think, like, now you have, like, you, you go on social media, you have all these footwork doctors and all this and yeah. that. And I think that helps them tremendously as well. And they're putting in the time. And for, you know, Chris Carter brought up Justin Jefferson and where he thinks he's going to fall in the echelon of Randy Moss, Chris Carter. And then, you know, where does Justin Jefferson fall in that? Uh, but we, I want to ask you that one because that one is a, that's I mean for me Randy Moss I don't think anybody can ever pass him. That's just I think it's, Randy Moss is the best receiver ever. I might get killed for that <laughs> Jerry Rice people, but Randy Moss to me is the best receiver. ever. So you got Randy and then what T O or, or Jerry Rice or Jerry and then T O or I got Randy J R and then T O. Oh okay, so Randy Jerry Rice T O. All right, I think Randy Moss is the most gifted receiver. Just. I think Randy Moss could roll out of bed and he was the best. <laughs> he was the best. Like, he didn't have to stretch. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> and I was, like I said, being a college kid here in Minnesota, I was blessed for four years to be able to watch him live uh, do the things he did in Minnesota. So it was it was fun to see uh, him. And like I said, I told Chris Carter, I told Jake Reed that, like, watching those guys when I was in college, uh, it was it was. I mean, it was awesome. Like as a receiver, it's like mm -hmm. you can you can literally just turn on your local team and learn from them. Uh, but when you think about Justin Jefferson, and people don't like to do this, um, but 1,800 yards a season, uh, Vikings record, uh, didn't pass Calvin Johnson. He had a lot more to go, but 1,800 yards a season, he was the receiving, he gets the crown this year. Tariq Hill was a little bit behind him. Um, er, this early in Justin's career, though, he's done something in three years that no other receiver's ever done. Uh, he's broken all kinds of records. Do can you say he's basically? I mean, four more years and he's a Hall of Famer. Can you say that about Justin Jefferson, or do you feel like you know what? We still need to see his entire resume. Um, in four more years, I will say we probably would need to see. I think Justin Jefferson is the best receiver in the league. If you ask me personally, um, I will say you need because I will ask. I will throw this question back at you: Is A. B. Antonio Brown the Hall? Yeah. Of See, and that one for me is tough because now we uh, we do have social media. I think off the field stuff is going to affect him forever okay, because the voters, you look, take away that, if you take away that, perfect. yes, I would say Antonio Brown is a Hall of Famer if you take away the off see, the field stuff. See, I would too. So that's why I would say this. Most people will say he's not the, like the pe the powers that be. Right. Will, yep. Will, I get it. And so I will say that like they look, they, they will throw up his off the field stuff. But when, like, I think they did T.O. wrong. T.O. should have been the first ballot. True. Um, I think that stuff is, like, you have to look at the body of work and quit letting, don't let your personal feelings get in to what this guy accomplished in his field. Exactly. And, 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 they, don't, and they can't seem to do that. And so if Justin Jefferson does it for seven years, if he wins a Super Bowl, I would definitely say yes. Um, because Terrell Davis did it for seven okay. years. But if he doesn't win a Super Bowl, I think they're going to come up with every reason not to put him in. So that he's got to do like a full T.O. 10-year, 11, 12-year. Yes. Yep. You know, he's got to be that. Yeah, he has to do that. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. So if Justin Jefferson is the best receiver in the NFL right now, in your opinion, who would you say is right on his heels? Tyreek Hill. Stephon D, my guy in Buffalo, Stephon yep. Diggs, Devontae Adams. Uh, oh, Jamar Chase is a monster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Cooper <laughs> Cup, you got to put Cooper Cup in there. Yeah. Cooper, I think Cooper Cup is a, a route technician. I think he's savvy in the way he gets things done. Yeah, and when you look at the Buffalo Bills, and so let's let's do a quick transition to that. Uh, you were, you know, you're a part of the Buffalo family. 
uh, when we saw DeMar Hamlin, and, and, and thank God, you know, he's getting better and better every day. Uh, but when you, being a part of the Buffalo Bills family, you know, seeing what was going on in Buffalo, uh, when you first saw the DeMar Hamlin news, uh, what kind of ran through your head as a player? Man, I started crying. I mean, I literally, my wife, my wife asked me what, like, she was like, what's going on? And I was like, man, I just hope this kid is good. Like, I, man, I mean, when they, we've never seen anything like that. So I, I was like, he was, they gave him CPR on the field. And then you saw the reaction from Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs and the guys not, and I just, I, I thought it, to be honest, I thought the worst just from their reaction and then the ambulance coming out and they administered CPR. So my, my mind just went into prayer. Like, I just hope he's all right. Um, and, uh, you know, I played, uh, I played a long time for that franchise. I mean, and I got hurt. My career ended in Buffalo, neck surgery, fusion, C2, C3. So um, being there seven years and the final year was all re uh, rehab, thinking I was going to be able to play, all that ran through my head. Like, man, I just hope he's able to walk again. Uh, I hope he's able to talk again. I don't even care about the football part of it. Mm -hmm. Just the human aspect of it. He's 24 years old, and he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know how to live life yet. He thinks he does, you know, because he's made it to the highest level. But he doesn't even know how to live life. He hasn't lived life yet. And I just was praying that he would be good, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough, uh, you know, but he is back and uh, he's, he's been traveling now. He's, he's his mm -hmm. family is in Buffalo to see him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it's it's one of those things that man, only God can do it. Uh, the human body is amazing. Uh, yeah. They are saying this was he had no pre-existing conditions because I know people were trying to go there. Nothing showed anything. Heart doesn't show anything to this day. It was a freak accident that just happened. And that's what the game of football sometimes is about, like. We sign up and we know we're gladiators and, you know, some of these hits, the body just, I mean, it's like being in a car accident. And so I heard Nate Burleson bring that up and, you know, and I heard Ryan Clark bring it up. So many people uh, don't understand that this is a dangerous game, but this is Perilous Price. I'm Ron Johnson. Uh, we got Sam Ekstrom joining us next. We're going to do the Daily Three. But remember, when you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota, you're getting endless Vikings talk with local experts. Subscribe to the free Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast feed wherever you find your podcast. You can find all of our videos on Locked On Sports Minnesota's YouTube channel. And we have a word from our sponsors. I've got a good Vikings Bills memory to ask Peerless about after I tell you about Built Bar. New Year's resolutions, you want to eat healthier, you want to get rid of the fat and calories, but you don't want to compromise taste. That's why you got to try Built Bars and their unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. You might be saying to yourself, well, that can't possibly be healthy. Ah, that's the catch. It is extremely healthy. It's healthy and it's tasty. Get a load of these macros. Only 130 calories, only 4 grams of sugar, but 17 grams of protein. And here's the clincher, 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. You can get these at built.com. Use the promo code locked on 15 for 15% off, or you can go in store to Walmart, get the four bar box, get some cookies and cream, double chocolate, coconut puff, or go to Sam's Club, get that Baker's dozen, 13 bar box with brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later, Built Bar. Well, we got the daily three coming up. That's three questions, three minutes each. We'll get peerless most of the time because, I mean, he's the star of the show, but take it away, Sam. All right, peerless. Time flies because I remember watching this game back in 2002. You guys were at the Metrodome playing the Vikings. I think it was week two. Crazy game. Final mm -hmm. score, 45-39. You've got a walk-off touchdown in overtime. What do you remember from that day? Oh, man. I remember, to be honest with you, I just remember Drew Bledsoe coming to me and Eric Mose. Um telling us on the sideline, we're going to have to win this game. Um, our defense is struggling. Uh, and at some point, we're going to have to make plays to win this game. And then, um, man, I just, it was an epic day for as a receiver because we were throwing it. We were throwing it like they throw it today. I mean, I think Moe's had about eight or nine catches. I know I had 13 for like 185 and two touchdowns. Whoa. And um, – and I just remember, and I was, you know, I told, just told Ron, I think Randy Moss is the greatest receiver ever. So mm -hmm. for me, I just want to put on a show in his place. 
Wow. That's Ron, a did you, you ever have a, a walk-off touchdown, Ron, any point in your career? <laughs> um, no, no, I don't think. I mean, I've had some big catches, um, mainly college, because like I think, and, and actually, I think Deion Grant was the safety in my first touchdown against the uh, Panthers, the first game of the year, my rookie year. Uh, ran like a slant and go, and I knew I was going to get hit. Deion Grant hits me in the back of the end zone, but, you know, and then, of course, it goes to review. So my first opportunity to have a review is my first catch ever. Uh, they end up calling a touchdown, said I came down with the ball. <laughs> back in the day, now, I think they probably would have looked at it a couple more times and probably said I didn't have control of it through the ground. But, um, but no, like, I've never had an overtime uh, walk. Every overtime I've been a part of, and I hate to say it, we lost. Like the Tennessee oh, wow. Titans overtime, we lost uh, because I think Anthony, I uh, forgot who was our quarterback at the time. I think it was Anthony Wright, uh, throws a pick to Samari Roll. So they, you know, and then they go stump on our logo in the middle of the field because we had beat them before uh, earlier in the season. They beat us in the playoffs. And so he gets a pick because uh, I don't know why we kept running the same play. We ran hitch out, hitch out. And I'm like, at some point, he's going to jump it. And he Fresh jumped it. Samari. Right. I'm like, come on, like change it up, coach. And, and Brian Billick just thought, let's 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 go down the field slowly. Let's kick a field goal, walk out of here. Well, Samari picks it, like eventually just said, you know, what, screw this. I'm gonna take a chance. Picks it off. They come down, they kick a field goal. We lose that one in overtime. Drew Brees beat us at Purdue in overtime. Uh twice we lost to uh, oh. like 80 seconds to go. Uh they drove the field 80 yards, kicked a field goal, then beat us in overtime. So yeah, I've never had a good overtime memory ever in football. Every uh, single time I go to overtime, Wisconsin, Ron Dane, they beat us in overtime. Like every time, every time I went to overtime, we lost. So that was not my goal. That's why to this day, when I'm covering the Vikings and we're doing these games, I'm getting ready to post game. I sweat a little bit in overtime because I'm like, I have bad memories. Like I have nightmares about overtime, which I still I don't know if you have these peerless. I still have the dream of like trying to get dressed for a game and you're always missing something. Like you, you're missing your jersey or your cleats. Or, and then I just wake up like, and I never make it to the game. So I don't know if that's my overtime nightmare of like never fight finishing a game. But yeah, to this day, I still have those dreams where I'm trying to get dressed for practice or a game and I never, ever make it out to practice. I don't know. Have you ever had that one? No, 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 no. Well, cause my, I will say my overtime, my overtime experiences are much better than yours. Yeah, so I'm yeah. probably at about eighty <laughs> percent. Yeah, uh, nothing but bad. Having a walk off. Uh, yeah, I just remember that day. I I will say when I scored it, and you know how everybody's coming to you. Y'all remember what God rest his soul, Charles Johnson. Yeah, uh, CJ Colorado Cordell Stewart. So that was, his last year in the league was with us in Buffalo. Okay. And so he's running over there. He picks me up and he looks in my eyes. He said, boy, you better not cry. <laughs> 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 I'm like, all right, OG, I ain't going to cry. I'm holding him back. I ain't going to cry. I'm definitely not going to cry now. He's going to be like, uh, what's his name from the Arizona Cardinals in that movie? Um, Cuba Good Jr. Yeah, Cuba yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. After he scored. What you got next, Sam? What's number two? Yeah, number two. Um, I want you both to look at the league today. Think about your skills as a wide receiver. Which offense do you think you would be the best fit in? Peerless will let you start. Oh, um, Kansas City. Mm. Yeah, good I'll, answer. I'll, I'll take Kansas City. I was going to say, Peerless, I remember your skill set. I feel like, honestly, you could put him in any of these offenses, like <laughs> the Rams, the Vikings, the Dolphins. I mean, yeah. at Buffalo Bills, like yeah. he would fit in in any of those. For me, um, I'm going to keep it simple. I, I got to look at a guy my size, which is Mike Evans. Like I got to go with Tom yeah. Brady because Mike mm -hmm. Evans, he's not asking him to do a bunch of – like I, I talked to Reggie Wayne because I coach Reggie with the coach, and I talked to Reggie before the Vikings game, which was the – greatest game in NFL history. Uh, but I talked to Reggie about his receivers because I watched Justin Jefferson in practice. And then I'm like, and I saw Stefan Diggs in practice. And I'm like, Reggie, are your guys doing these type of releases? And Peerless, you know exactly what I'm talking about. These crazy receiver factory releases off the line. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. that, and he's uh -huh. like, hell no. He's like, there's no way Michael Pittman Jr. can do what Stefan Diggs off the line. Right. He's like, he's like, I'm teaching them the same stuff you and Clyde Christensen taught me. Like the same stuff that like it's the basic release, you know, quick hands, get up the field, mm -hmm. eat up separation. So that's mm -hmm. why when I watch Tom Brady and Mike Evans, Mike Evans is doing the Jerry Rice releases. Like he's not trying right. to be something different like Stefan. Stefan Diggs did a crossover behind the back off the line. Of yeah. Like 
Like, yeah. I, and then like Justin Jefferson on his out route, he did like a, a crossover one leg behind the other leg. And I'm like, how in the heck are you not getting quick jammed? Uh, but it works. And so for me, I'm, I got to go Buffalo or uh, Buccaneers because I got to find somebody my size. And Mike Evans mm-hmm. right now, I think it's one of the only, and then the coach, because I did talk to Reggie about that. Like the coach do run some of the same mm-hmm. stuff, but yeah, I need, I'm a big receiver. I'm not, I can't give you all that. I can give you some digs, some hitches, some slants, okay. comebacks. That's it. That's it. Give me the red zone. Give me, give me in the red and blocking. Like I love, to, I, and they can't do it anymore, which pisses me off. I watched film last night when we broke down on TV for Fox. We did the whole uh, playoff scenario. They can't crack block anymore. Like I didn't no. realize that. Like I was no, like, you can't. you can't crack block on the you, D and the safety. None of that. It's crazy. Like I watched Justin Jefferson do most dangerous man. He came down. And so even for me, I got to go to a team that they run kind of toss crack, but you can't crack. You got to just be in the way. Right. So I'm like, that, that you're setting receivers you up to get ran see. over. Yeah, like you, you you're setting me up to get blown up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what you got next, Sal? Yep, one more. Uh, think about the teams in the playoffs. Think about the receivers in the playoffs. I want one name. Who are we maybe sleeping on? Who are we not talking about going into the playoffs that could turn into a star at the receiver position before the playoffs are over? Oh. Um, it, well... He, I, if they win, mm-hmm. um, are we looking at teams we think can win or just who could be a star? Because yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, if they only have one game, you're right. It's hard to be a star. So you might right. have to think about a because, team that, that might go all the way. Yeah. Uh, I'll go to Darius Tom. All right. Kansas mm-hmm. City. That's good. Because oh. that guy's got a lot of talent. And I think when he first got to Kansas City, we, the very first game he got there, we saw a lot of it. Then he ended up getting hurt. So he was out of multiple weeks. But I think he has the opportunity to be special. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for me, I think – so if it doesn't count wins, I think K.J. Osborne can make a name for himself in the playoffs. Like K.J. Osborne for the Vikings as the third receiver, kind of the number two right now because Adam Thielen's been hurt. Um, Justin Jefferson's going to get all the looks. Like he's going to get all the coverage. Mm-hmm. He's going to get all – like. The Giants are going to sell out to stop him. So KJ is going to be a star, but I don't know if they can get much further. If I had to go for somebody who I think can get a little bit further, I got to go with Brandon Ayuk with the 49ers. Like I think Brandon Ayuk is, is oh. doing things that are a little bit different. And when you think about Samuels and what Debo does, Brandon Ayuk gives you the true down the field receiver stuff. And Brock Purdy is going to have to get the ball out of his hands because Seattle is going to come after him. They're going to try to make this rookie feel what the playoffs and the pressure feels like. So I think – uh, Brandon Ayuk. And then from the Bills, I got to go with Gabe Davis. Like Gabe Davis, I, well, I think. I don't think Gabe Davis under the radar anymore. I, but I'm talking about for like playoff star. Like I feel like Stefan yeah. Diggs is the star, but yeah. I feel like Gabe Davis is going to have is, himself. A, he's like, a I, yeah, he's a baller. And and we know like what happened in the Vikings game with Gabe Davis and that non catch that shouldn't have been a catch, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But when you think about the playoffs, like I feel like Stefan Diggs, Gabe Davis, like those guys watching the confetti fall, uh, you know, all that stuff, like that's bur- – and, and Peerless, you know, like as a receiver, that's burning in his head. He's like, man, I don't want to drop a ball. I want to make a play. He's not under the radar, but I feel like he can become a star this playoffs to the point where he can – like he might end up getting a big contract from somebody else where somebody yeah, else might reach no, out I'd be like – exactly. Uh, and one quick one before we got out of here. Daily Three is done. I want to appreciate Peerless Price for joining us on the Ron Johnson Show. We got Sam Ekstrom. Peerless, one more quick one, man. I always like to have a fun one before we get out of here. Yeah. You talked about basketball. That's and I've done tough. this with Justin Jefferson because Justin Jefferson uh, had him on the show. Not this show, but I had him on a different show for time. And uh, Justin Jefferson, we talked about basketball. One quick one before we get out of here. Basketball. There's always, like, in the locker room, who's the better? Tight ends, receivers, running backs, DBs, so on and so forth. Uh, in your opinion, would you have said, you know, in your time as a receiver group, you guys were the best hoopers in the locker room or were the tight ends? Because Justin Jefferson said he's the best hooper on his team. Like, he's oh, like, by far. Me and Eric Moses are the best hoopers on our team. It so was, there's uh, no question. No, it was No, we, like, we, me and Eric Moses really thought we were going to the NBA. I mean, <laughs> like, like, we literally in Buffalo in the offseason, we hooped with Cliff Robinson, Chris oh, yeah. Lager at UB, University of Buffalo. Like, we we hooped, hooped. <laughs> I still hoop to this day. <laughs> like, a men's, like, 
a straight up men's league with all former athletes, a lot of former NBA guys. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, we well, appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate you joining me on the Ron Johnson Show, man. Uh, Got to get you back as the playoffs go. The Buffalo Bills are probably going to go pretty far, so we'll definitely have to get you back, get your take on that. But I also want people to remember, when you're looking at Locked On Sports Minnesota, you can get endless Vikings talk. Make sure you subscribe to the Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube feed uh, so you can get all of our videos, all of our shows, instant podcasts, updates every time they're updated, and, of course, the Vikings press conferences and other press conferences as they come. We're going to deliver all the biggest news all season long. Like our videos and leave your comments in the section below. I want to thank you guys for joining us, and have a great day.